Bibles. And let's go to the book of Daniel. Lord willing, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at the life of Daniel and learning some lessons about how to live a life faithfully. In fact, in Daniel, you'll find Daniel going through 70 years of ministry. Not once does he fail. You see him as a young man, you see him as an old man, and in between. And you'll find that he is faithful, not just Daniel, but Daniel's faithful friends that we're going to be looking at today. Daniel's faithful friends that we're going to be looking at next week, as, uh, actually in two weeks. No, it'll be, it'll be next week. As we look at uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, as well in this morning's message. Our world is governed by a playboy philosophy. Uh, just admit it. We're a pornographic society. We're perverse. Uh, we're profane. We're permissive. We're promiscuous. It's the world that we have been dealt. It's where we live. Maybe it's our fault as a church for not standing up over the last uh, several decades and declaring the Word of God openly and publicly and standing against certain uh, items that have come up. I don't know whose fault it is, but it's, it's who we are. It's the world that we live in. Why should it not be? Uh, it's the world. The world has taken control of our schools, of our government. It's taken control of our business. What do we expect from the world? Do we expect them to be righteous and holy? No, not at all. What bothers me, however, is that what I see is crept into the church. Not only is the world becoming worse as far as morality, so is the church. Somehow we've brought the rhetoric into the church that the world is teaching. And one of those rhetorics that I hate the most is, is that young people just have to sow their wild oats. Many parents and those who work with teens have a philosophy say, that says basically, kids will be kids. That's just the blunders of youth. It's only natural for them to go out and to do things and to experiment. In fact, some adults even encourage that. That before you settle down, you need to go out and live some life. Get some experiences. And what they're talking about is enjoying life, which, by the way, if you ask me, it's destroying life. The overwhelming consensus among adults is that teens must be allowed to live it up. Or if they don't, when they settle down in marriage, it just won't work. They want them to settle down and be sensible and have serious contemplations. They want for them to be able to hold down a job and raise their own kids. Grandparents don't want to be raising their kids for them. They, they want that, but they somehow figure that they need to go ahead and enjoy life to begin with. And as long as they get that out of their system, then, then the kids will settle down and somehow they'll turn into proper adults making good decisions. Listen to me, raising teenagers is intentional. What you sow, you reap. And if that's your attitude about these ages from let's say 12 to 20, is that just let them go ahead and experiment with all these things in life and give very little guidance, do no criticism, just let them live and enjoy life and then we'll get them settled down. Well, that's not working. It's just not working. Look around you. What you sow, you reap reap. And it's important for us to make sure that we start well. A farmer who's going to have a good crop, what's the most important decision? Plow the field? No, that is a part of it. Make sure you irrigate? Well, no, that, you got to have some of that once in a while. Keep the weeds out? Well, that's important. No, it's what you're going to sow. If you want corn, what do you sow? You got to decide. What kind of crop do you want? That's the most important thing is deciding what kind of crop you want. And if you're going to sow wild oats, don't expect to get corn or wheat or something productive. Spurgeon said this, if you want a good end to life, then have a good beginning. You want a good end to a day? Have a good, good morning. Start the day well if you want a good ending. And that's what is important. The pattern of life, character, the conduct that we set early in those preteen years and through those teenage years, those will last us the rest of life. They are a priority. And if we set down those firm characteristics in our hearts, then we're going to have productive life and we're going to yield much fruit. But if you do not, 
If you sow your wild oats, let me tell you what you're going to reap. You're going to reap remorse and bitterness. There's an old adage that says the, the folly of youth becomes the vice of middle age and the remorse of old age. So let's make sure that we begin well. And by looking at these young men as they're just beginning to come into adulthood, let's say they're probably somewhere around 13 to 15 years old, and they're beginning to sow some things into their lives that are going to be productive in years to come, let's make sure that we look and see what those ideals are and have those same kind of characteristics and desires. Well, let's stand together. And the reading this morning is going to be rather lengthy, but I think you need to hear, hear the entire story. But beginning in Daniel 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, that is king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God. And he carried them into the land of Shinar, that is into Babylon, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. So these are some of the upper crust kids. These kids are raised up in the palace and around the king and around the politicians. Get some of those young children and bring them. Verse 4, young men and who there is no blemish, good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, and who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah, that is, all these kids were from Judah, most of them, we believe, all of them, we believe, are descendants from David. From not just the tribe of Judah, they're David's descendants, possibly even the king's sons or grandchildren. And so they brought from Judah Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which they drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age, then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Az Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us drink vegetables or give us vegetables to eat and, and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you in the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy. And as you see fit, then so deal with your servants. Let's put it to the test. See whose, whose food is going to come out a little bit, uh, making them look uh, more healthy. So he consented to them in this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of those 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine which they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of days, that's at the end of the three years, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them and among them all was none found like Daniel and Hananiah, and Mishael and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. That means for 70 years he continued to serve in that realm. May God richly bless the reading of the scriptures. You may be seated. 
As we look at the story of these four faithful friends, let's begin first of all with the time of Daniel and his friends. We find that in verse 1 and 2. It was a time of turmoil in the life of Israel. The year he gives us in verse number 1 is 605 B.C. 605 B.C. That's important because one of the great kings of Israel, Josiah, died in 609 B.C. So four years before this, King Josiah died at a battle and that uh, with the Egyptians. The Egyptians had kind of taken over the realm of Israel. But now in 605, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes in. He destroys the Assyrian army. He destroys the uh, Egyptian army. And he comes to Babylon and they open the gates because there's nothing they could do. They were allies with the Egyptians. Nothing they could do. So they opened the gate and uh, the king of Babylon did not destroy the city. He did not kill the people. But he says, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put you as king, and you're going to be king. You're going to pay your taxes, and you're going to pay your taxes every year to me. You make sure you keep those taxes coming. And by the way, I'm going to take some of your finest young men. Now, these were guys that were going to become slaves to the king of Babylon, but also they're more than slaves, they're hostages. In other words, if you rebel against us, you do something we don't like, we'll put these young men to death. So it's important for you to do what you're supposed to be doing here or else it's going to fall apart. And so at 605, and Israel is under the thumb of a tyrannical king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Also, the time was morally deplorable for the the nation Israel. They were spiritually bankrupt. Israel had become a godless nation. And may I say, no more godless than America has become. Even though we have much religion in America and we got churches and we got synagogues and we got mosques and we got all kinds of ideals concerning religion, the truth is they were a godless people. They worshiped idols, they worshiped false gods, they did all kinds of deplorable evils such as adultery and immorality, they lied, they stole. They were a deplorable group of people. Even though called the children of God, they were certainly behaving like a child of the devil. And God had determined that he was going to give them into a 70 year, into 70 year exile. And that exile begins with Daniel and his friends. That starts the 70 years. Now, not not all of them go into exile, but some of them will. And two other occasions, this will happen over the next few years of Israel's life until finally the nation is destroyed. Most of them are all taken into captivity. It's a terrible time. Sometimes, young people, you have to play the hand you're dealt with. Sometimes you grow up in a nation that is prosperous as you have been growing up in America, but things change very rapidly. Listen to me. Do not think God cannot bring down the American economy. Do not think that God cannot overcome the American military. We think, because it has been going on for 70 plus years, we think we're going to continue in the pattern that we're going. And I promise you this, it's about to change. You better begin to contemplate living in a time when your Christianity, when your desire to serve the Lord is going to not be favorably looked upon. In fact, already in Jerusalem at this time, Jeremiah, a prophet, is preaching the word of God. And he's being persecuted for it, prosecuted for it, put in jail for it. Others are being put to death for it, as we've been studying on Wednesday night during that time period. Isaiah, not long before this, was put to death for preaching the gospel. There's coming a time in America, it will be the same. When it's going to be difficult to live out your Christian life. So we better do some changing quickly or else our young people, our children, our grandchildren are going to be living in a nation where it's not favorable to show up on church Sunday morning. And it's certainly not going to be favorable to stand up in the culture and say, thus said the Lord God Almighty, this is wrong, this is right. Or there's one way of salvation. There's a second thing, not just the time of Daniel, but there's the trial of Daniel and his friends that they went through. It talks about it in verse 3 through 7. As young men, they were led away captive. That means they were left behind their family, their friends, the customs that they were used to, their culture. The Jewish culture was all left behind. Their country is no longer their country. And they literally are becoming slaves, that is, hostages to a pagan king, And subject to his whims. And by the way, his whims are very whimsical. 
I mean, this guy could wake up one day and say, put all those guys to death. We'll see that in chapter number uh, two uh, tonight if you come back. Uh, th 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 he can set up an idol and says, everybody has to bow down and worship this idol. And if you don't bow down and worship this idol, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And he does that. And some of these young men are going to wind up in the fiery furnace. And so that's the kind of life they lived in. You didn't know when you got up each day what kind of mood he was going to be in or what kind of silly law he was going to enact and say, you have to do this. And so it's a difficult time in their lives. They're under trial. Possibly, in verse number 3 and 8, it says they were put under the chief of the eunuchs. And it is possible they were made eunuchs, though maybe not. That means they could no longer have children. Uh, they were fixed to a point where they could, uh, could not uh, even have relationships with women. They would often do that because uh, they didn't want them to reproduce. But Isaiah chapter 39, Isaiah prophesied this. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hezekiah was king of Israel at that time, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your father has accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Now, that's what happened. Babylon came in and took all the temple items and took a bunch of their wealth and took it back to Babylon. And they shall take away some of your sons who are descended from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so it was a time of trial and difficulty. And the desire of Nebuchadnezzar and those in control in Babylon was to denationalize them. To make them not speak their own language anymore. To learn the language of the Babylonians. To re-educate them to fit into Babylonian society. To sever every tie with their God and with their religion and with their, their country. To make them like themselves, in other words. And I'll tell you, young people, that's what the world wants. The world wants you to leave your Christianity behind. It wants you to leave those Bible studies that mom and dad raised you up in. Those times when you go to church. They want you to leave those behind don't bring them to college. We'll re-educate you. We'll tell you how you ought to think. We'll tell you where your parents were wrong, where your pastor was wrong, and, and how our way is so much better. And they'll try to re-educate you. In fact, they not only tried to re-educate them, they gave them different names, Babylonian names. Every name here, and I'm not going to take the time to do this, but every name of these young men had God's name in it, Yahweh in it, the God of Israel. Daniel, for instance, the, the word any word that ends in E-L, E-L is the word for God, okay? And so Daniel means God is my judge or the judge God. And uh, so Daniel means God is my judge. All of them had names like that. When they got rid of them, those names, the Babylonians wiped those names out, which by the way was common. When Joseph went into Egypt, they gave him a different name. Uh, the story of Esther. Esther's not her uh, name that they give her. They, 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 there's a different name. That, so they changed her name. The, the names are just changed. But every name that these young men were given had one of the gods of the Babylonians' name in it. And so this was purposely done. And young people, I want to tell you, the world doesn't want you thinking different than it. It doesn't want you being loyal to your God. It doesn't want you to be loyal to your faith. It wants you to compromise at least a little bit. Come out from that stuff that you've been taught and let us tell you what it's really all about so that you can live in this kind of society. And a lot of people are buying into it. They're letting their Christian heritage go by the wayside. Now, I'm not talking about silly customs that doesn't make any difference, not even tied to Scripture. But I'm talking about those things that are faith-based, Bible uh, principles that have been taught to us. And the world wants to re-educate us and to make us fit into its mode. And these young men's trials were enormous. They had every right to feel like they were forsaken by their God. And I'm sure many of those people who went into Babylon said, God's forsaken us, forget about God. Why not serve other gods? God didn't take care of us. Can you imagine being Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you've done everything you can to serve God? You've been faithful in every kind of circumstances. You've been faithful to your parents. You've been faithful to your faith. You've done everything. And now you're a slave. Now you've lost everything. And you're off in a different country being re-educated. It might be easy to say, well, just forget God then. He forgot me. I'll just do whatever 
when, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. Go along with everybody else. But they did not do that. The trials were very difficult. Those trials would last for 70 years. But then let's look at the testing. Trials come upon us to test, to test our faith, to test our character. Young people, you'll never know really what you're made of until you go through trials. But listen, every trial has a test mixed in it. Are you going to turn away from God and embrace the things of this world? Are you going to turn away from those who have taught you proper understanding of Scripture and turn to a world that really has no love, no concern for you whatsoever, but wants to re-educate you? So trials and left test our, our faith and our allegiance to God. The difficult circumstances do not make our character. They just reveal our character. Some of these young men are going to just go right along because that's their character. They've already been serving false gods. They've already been serving idols. They've been doing wickedness. And they're just going to go along and get along. But not Daniel, not Shadrach, not Meshach, not Abednego. In verse number 8 it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And so Daniel gets there and Daniel sees, whoa, just a second, we've got a problem. My God has commanded me that I can't eat certain foods. They need to be kosher. They need to be certain kinds of food, properly prepared. It's a law that's in our books that God has given to the Israelites. And Daniel says, I've got to keep that law. Now Daniel knows he's willing to keep that law even if it means death. He's willing to do whatever it is. But Daniel does what is smart. And Daniel approaches the people in charge and say, hey, listen, uh, I can't eat that. I, I would rather eat this. Now listen, that would sound something like this. The king of Babylon, though he was a despot and though he was a tyrant, he also was pretty smart. He didn't bring these guys in from these other countries. And it wasn't just Israel he brought in people from. It was from other countries, Assyria, Egypt, other places. He brought these people in. He didn't throw them into a prison and give them bread and water. And just say, you're going to sit there and if your parents don't obey and do what I tell them to do, I'm going to kill you. He didn't treat them like that. He brought them in and says, listen guys, get cleaned up. You're going to serve me. He gave them a three-year scholarship. Best education the world had at that time. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about mathematics and science and all these other disciplines. We're going to teach you everything you need to know in three years. That's why they wanted them about 13, 14, 15 years old is so they could educate them in these understandings. We're going to teach you our language, which at that point in time, they used cuneiform in uh, Babylon. So they had to learn a whole new alphabet. They're going to teach them these things, but also we're going to give you a nice place to live. And you're going to get to eat the same thing the king eats. I mean, the same kind of food the king eats off his table, that's what you're going to eat as well. So you're going to eat well, you're going to drink well, you're going to be well housed, well cared for, well clothed, well educated. And they did. They treated those folks that way. But one day they could just, he could just wake up and say, kill them all, which we'll see tonight. Just, just wipe them all out. But that was what he was doing. He was offering them the best. Can you imagine someone coming and saying, I don't want that? That's not good enough for me. Now, he didn't do it that way. He just simply came and said, hey, could we just eat the vegetables? That's, that's really what we want to eat. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating meat if it's properly cooked, but he knew that the meat that they did, they strangled oftentimes to keep the blood in because it was more tender. That was a no-no. Plus the fact they ate things like ham. You don't want a honey-cured ham come out in front of you if you're a Jew. They don't eat those things. They weren't to eat any kind of pork. Oftentimes, did you know this? The Babylonians even, they even treasured a horse flesh. And that was another one of those animals God said they couldn't eat. So anyway, they decide we're not going to eat this food. But he does it in a polite way. That's the way Christians ought to approach every subject. Firmly, with my principles intact, knowing I'm not going to defile myself. But hey, is there some way here we can talk about this? And so he comes to the, the, the guy in charge and says, hey, let's do a little test. Let, let us eat our food for 10 days. Just bring us these kind of foods. Let them eat. And some of those would be Jewish people. Some from 
Egypt, some from Assyria and other countries. Let them eat their food. After 10 days, that's plenty of time to see. See who's the most healthy. Take a look at us and see who's, who's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So, okay, we'll, we'll try it for 10 days. We'll, we'll just give this a test. And so he decides not to uh, defile himself. When they come back out, of course, the test says and shows that Daniel and them were just as healthy, if not more healthy, than everybody else. Now, again, here's the principle by which we have to live as young people. And I believe this goes into adulthood, and I hate to say it, that most people I'm around are compromisers. Now, I want you to compromise on everything that's non-essential. In fact, the Bible says, prefer others before yourself. If you've got a preference, compromise it if it's not a principle. If it's not a biblical mandate from God, we ought to compromise. Get along with people. When as much as possible, be at peace with all people. If you're asking about where to eat, I don't care. They need, they need to put a restaurant out there, I don't care. That's... that's Go to that one. That's, that's where I'll go. It doesn't matter. I, I, there's things that are just not that big a deal. Just compromise and go on. But when it comes to the principles of the Word of God, the thou shalt not that God has given to us, we have to determine our hearts. We're not going to violate those. We're not going to defile our minds with pornography. We're not going to compromise and go to an R-rated movie where we know there's going to be sex scenes. We're not going to compromise ourselves where we know they're going to go to a place where alcohol is going to be the largest part of that party. We're not going to compromise ourselves and wear clothes that are uh, risque and draw attention to our natural body rather than to the spiritual part of us. And yet, during our time, people are so compromising. Just take the Lord's Day. Now, I don't believe there's a scripture that says, thou shalt not desecrate the Lord's Day. Every Lord's Day, you need to be sitting in the pew at your church. Uh, th there's nothing that says that. But the Bible does teach us that we're to put God before all else. How many times on the Lord's Day do people compromise and put something else before God? Now, there's times we can't. There's times we can't be at church. And I understand that. My wife today is with one of our grandkids. They stayed the night. He was sick all night throwing up. And so she stayed home with him out to take care of him. Can't be here today. Doesn't mean she sinned against God. But I'll promise you this. If he was healthy, she would be here. That's just the way it is with those who are committed to Jesus Christ. We have certain principles, certain priorities. This is life. This is who we are. This is how we live. There are certain things that we won't drink in our family. There are certain things we don't allow our kids to wear when they were growing up. It's just that way. And when we compromise, it gets so much easier to compromise. Yeah, it's just food today. Isn't it amazing that the temptation of Eve was about what? Food. and Eat an apple. The temptation about Jesus, where did it begin? Yeah, Turn this bread, uh, turn this stone into bread. Food. Silly to think about food being that big a deal, isn't it? And yet in both those temptations, it was food. It was the eating of certain things. Because you see, if you can't overcome temptation in the small areas of life, what makes you think you're going to stand when a king says, you better bow down to that idol or I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace? Or you better not pray or I'm going to throw you to the, into the lion's den? You see, if you compromise on the small end of things, what makes you think you're going to stand on the big end of things? You see, compromise leads to compromise. And if you've been compromising, repent. Now, I'm not talking about being hard-shelled about things we don't need to be hard-shelled about. I'm not talking about legalists. I, I don't like legalism. People who want you to live according to what they say you ought to live rather than you reading the Word of God, looking through Scripture and finding out how Jesus wants you to live. That was the legalist. That was the people who had problems with Jesus. He wasn't religious enough for them. They were always criticizing Jesus for breaking one of their laws. I'm not talking about that at all. Okay? I'm talking about very clear principles. How is it that a whole denomination has a problem knowing who should be married and who shouldn't be married? Almost to the point that the whole denomination split. 
How could half the people of a denomination believe that it's okay for a woman to marry a woman, for a man to marry a woman? How is that even an issue? Have you, have you read what the delegation of the Methodists coming from Africa? I mean, they are just appalled. They, they must be sitting over there in Africa shaking their heads thinking, what are those crazy Americans thinking? They have to send their delegation over here to stop their denomination from ordaining homosexuals as priests or as, as leaders in their church, as performing same-sex marriages, as giving approval to same-sex marriages. You see, our world is a compromising world, and the church has become a compromising church. They compromise on abortion, compromising on alcohol, compromising on gambling. You say, well, those are some issues I'm not real sure about. Well, get sure about them. I'm pretty sure about them. I've got some principles that I stand on, and I, that's where I'm going to stand. You don't have to stand on the same principles I stand. But I'm not going to compromise those areas of life. And young people, you're going to be tested. When you go off to college, you're going to be under some of the most intense scrutiny, oftentimes even laughed at. If you even say something to the point of, I believe the world was created by God in six days and he rested on the Sabbath, somewhere around 6,000 years ago. And just saying that, you're going to be laughed at and scorned. Or I believe the Bible to be the Word of God. I believe that God has very clearly in His Word given us instruction that there's one way of salvation for all individuals, and it's through Jesus Christ. You see, we've compromised so much, most people don't even know what we stand for any longer as followers of Christ. And so there's going to be times of testing. What harm can it be in eating a little piece of fruit? What harm can it be in eating some of the delicacies off the king's table? What harm can it be in drinking a little wine and, and drinking those things that are intoxicating? That's not a big deal. You know, particularly since we're going through all these difficulties, that's just a small matter. Yet these young men said, no, I'm not going to do that. You see, character is the first attack in small areas. And finally, it becomes a reproach. Then finally... Notice the triumph. Notice the triumph of Daniel and his friends. Verse 17 through 21. Daniel and them approached the situation the way it needed to be approached. Please, sir, is it all right? If we try this, let's do this, let's do that. Gentle, meek, and yet very firm. And it works out. And you think, well, that's not a big matter. Well, look at verse 17. And for the four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill. In other words, God blessed them. Above all the other people that had come into captivity from the Egyptian culture, which was very knowledgeable about certain things and raised their kids with a great deal of knowledge, the Assyrians and others, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was smarter, more intelligent, skilled in literature. In other words, God gave them even the ability to learn the language quicker than the other guys. You say, well, God do that? Well, yes, God blesses faithfulness. You can never be faithful to God and God not bless it. You say, well, but they're slaves. Yeah, that's, read the story of Joseph. We'll talk a little bit about Joseph tonight. Joseph went through so many trials and testings and so many difficulties. Yes, his life was basically a hell on earth for over 13 years. I mean, it was just terrible life. And yet God blessed him in every turn of his life to where finally God lifted him up. And so there's a triumph of here. Daniel even was given a gift of understanding visions and dreams, just like Joseph. Verse number 18, they were taken before the king after the three years, and the king found in verse number 19, when the king did an interview, they got to meet the president of the United States. They got to meet the king of the universe. They walked into the Oval Office, and the king sat down with them and started talking with them, and the king was amazed. But this time, they're probably 16, 17, 18-year-old, and these boys understood Things probably the king didn't even understood. And he was amazed at them. And the Bible says that he put them into positions. And we're going to see that Daniel is going to raise up his friends to that position as well. And so there's a triumph there. Young people, I will promise you this. Be faithful. Be faithful. Trust God. Don't compromise. Particularly in the area of sexuality. You see, the follies of youth become the vices of middle age and the remorse of old age. 
do you want a good reputation among the world? Or do you want a good reputation among God? You want to get along with the world? Or do you want to be a servant of the living God? You have to determine in your heart. I can't determine that for you. But I can tell you this. You want to know the name Daniel had among Jesus? With Jesus? Daniel the prophet. That's what Jesus said about Daniel. Well, don't you want Jesus' opinion of you to be that which is the most important? And Jesus said, Daniel the prophet. He's basically saying, Daniel was my man. I put my word in his heart, and he delivered it to the nation of Babylon. I, I want for God to be able to say in the day of judgment about you, that's my servant. That one pleased me. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Please, before the days get old, before you get to a point where life is miserable and bitter, please repent. Set down in your heart the biblical characteristics of who Jesus is, what the Bible says a Christian should be. Seek those while you're young. Set a pattern in this part of life, in, in the youth area. And adults, this is for us as well. Set down and sow good seeds so that when the crop comes due, then it will be good fruit. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you again for an opportunity just simply to open the word and let it, let it come alive, let it teach us. And Father, we recognize that we are a compromising people oftentimes. And we pray, Father, we haven't compromised in those areas where it makes a difference. Help us to search your word, to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us, Father, to seek you above all else, to please you. If there be any among us today, Father, who do not yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that even right now, they'll be contemplating giving their life to Christ. Letting him be Lord from this moment forward. Letting him call the shots. Father, I... I know we have to be a slave, but help us not to be a slave to Babylon. Help us to be a slave to you. We'd rather serve you than all the things of this world. So help us that we might sanctify our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing together, if you need to come for prayer or rededication of life, come to join this fellowship. Or simply come and acknowledge openly and publicly that Jesus is going to be your Lord from this moment forward. Then you come.